Okay. Hi, George. How are you? Good, Douglas. Nice to meet you here and, and uh, doing well. Thank you for coming on the show. It's nice to have you here. As we were talking about before we got on, I, I've got a bio here from you that's got all kinds of good information. So as I was reading through it before we got on, what caught my eye, the first sentence that I wanted to start off with, is what are you best known for? That's what it says right there. And there's a few things. I'm just going to read them. Father of the life planning movement in financial advice, meditation teacher for over 30 years, photographer and poet, author of 12 books, and fiduciary advocate and thought leader. And my first question is, is a fiduciary advocate, is that different than a financial advisor? Yeah, the, the way I understand it, I'm, I'm trying to pitch something uh, that's much larger than that. Um, there are a lot of financial advisors that use the term fiduciary, and I think it's a good, they're, by and large, it's a good use of the term. But uh, fiduciary really means trustworthy. It goes back to a Latin root of, of trust. And, you know, we're in a civilization right now that's just crazy with polarization and, and bullying and threats to, whether it's the threats to the earth or threats, threats to democracy or more often threats to each other and lack of trust. And so I have come up with a single sentence uh, proposal to solve a huge amount of the problems that we're facing right now. And it's a proposal that we become a fiduciary culture. So there are financial advisors who are fiduciaries. And that means that they charge a certain way with their clients uh, that, and they're not just servants to the product companies that are salespeople for the product companies. But a fiduciary culture would work I mean, gosh, Doug, if you think about it, this, this 250 years ago, we had this explosion of, of, uh, of growth that began. And if it was absolutely the very best way of structuring everything, and it's been pretty phenomenal, wouldn't we see the very best of humanity at the top of every hierarchy of power? We'd see our wisdom and our compassion, but we don't find that. And so, and we're, we're in a tough place right now. So my proposal is that every institution, whether corporate or nonprofit or governmental, be required to place the interests of humanity, of the truth, of democracy, and of the planet ahead of their own self-interest. Very simple. And I think if that were a piece of legislation that passed, it would be it would change things dramatically um, and all over the world. Well, I totally agree with you, but I'd have to say that that is wishful thinking on our politicians particularly because theoretically people go into politics to try to help their fellow man. And then once they settle into the Washington swamp, it gets sort of diluted and they either just sort of go along with what's going on there and go through the motions and I mean, it's it's almost like a utopian kind of an idea. Yeah, that would be great. How do you get people to do that? How do you get rid of greed and self-interest in human nature? Well, um, a couple of things about that. The, uh, um, I mean, the new book that I've just come out with, The Three Domains of Freedom, uh, talk a lot about uh, greed and self-interest and how do we uh, lessen that in each of us so that we ha act with greater wisdom or greater kindness. And there, there are certainly uh, the, the subtitle of the book, The Three Domains of Freedom, is each moment is yours, your life is yours, civilization is yours. And the notion is that we, uh, we were all meant to live in freedom. Human beings were meant to live in freedom. We thrive when we experience freedom. And that there are these three realms of it, each moment, our, our life, and, and then civilization. Civilization is the one you and I are talking about right now, and it's the one that's most problematic. Um, but the, the, the place that I'm known probably most, if you Googled me, would be in the financial world, where I pioneered a way of working with clients or individuals um, to inspire them to grab hold of the vision they care about most, about becoming who they want to be, 
most in life and make that the focus of the financial work that your hopefully fiduciary advisor would do for you. And what we found by doing that, and we did that for all the advisors that we trained as well. And what we found by doing that is that everybody is missing something. And when they when they have a vision that is so exciting and thrilling and strong for them, they don't let obstacles get in their way. So their greed gets out of the way, their anxiety gets out of their way, it, all the stuff that gets in the way gets out of the way because the vision is so strong. So what I want to do with this book and with what I call fiduciary in all things, this message is get it out there and get the vision strong enough that as utopian as it seems, we all go, yeah, might be utopian, but how else are we going to survive, uh, whether as a democracy or as a planet or as a people? Not only that, but it's what I'd like my grandchildren to live into. Well, I was going to bring that up about the family, because when you talk about financial planning and if people are astute enough to start when they're in their 20s, a lot of people don't. Um, generally speaking, they're planning for the future of their children. So in that sense, that is sort of part of the utopian idea because it's about compassion. It's about kindness. It's they're not thinking of themselves. I'm going to put this money away so I can buy a Rolls Royce or a Ferrari. I'm putting it away for my kids, for their future. Right. Isn't that along the same lines? Well, it's similar. Um, we ask as part of the this work that we call life planning, and it's that second domain of freedom, the domain that your life is yours. We ask people what you know, what do you care about most? We, we ask them uh, life and death questions. If you only had uh, 24 hours left to live, what did you miss? Who did you not get to be? What did you not get to do? And it's rarely about the Rolls Royce. It it. It's very often about the kids, but it could be something else. It could be a piece of music they really didn't quite finish that would have been just fabulous, that they didn't touch an audience or the um, or they, they didn't live in the place they really longed to live in. And uh, they weren't able to be the uh, have the kindness that they wanted to have or the or speak to truth because of the job constraints that they had. So we find what it is they care about most and it's hardly ever a Rolls Royce. And we go, OK, let's make this happen. And we build it into a vision. So it, it's layered with all the things they really love. And then there's nothing that stands in their way. <laughs> they shift their life changes and they make it happen. And I think it's time for us to do that with civilization as well. And what you're saying about politicians is right. You know, they're in a way they're part of the problem. But the um, but we need to have our vision strong enough about this is what we want. And then I think we can talk to the politicians and uh, uh, craft legislation and make it happen. OK, well, we've been circling around the word fiduciary and I've only heard that word used within the context of financial, the financial industry. OK, but the way you explained it, we're going to use it in tandem with trust. Yeah. Yeah. How do we bring back the trust in our institutions, particularly in government? Because I don't care if you're on the far left or the far right politically. It seems no one trusts the government at this point, and rightfully so. Yeah. I mean, I think we've been lied to uh, on many different occasions. So how do we bring that back? Is there anything? Where do we start? I, I think we uh, we needed it at every level. I, I I think we needed it government. I think we need it with our nonprofits, and I think we need it with our uh, corporations. I don't see in any of those institutions, those large institutions, um, wisdom and compassion uh, at the top. There there are things they've done that have been great, and things they've done that have been egregious. But uh, so my my thought with that, Doug, is that we we need something that simply says that this is what we stand for as a people. I mean, you talk about government. Government's a huge part of not only the problem, but also the, the potential solution. But it's also a part of who we are. Civilization ultimately is who we are. So it's corporate government, 
the arts, music, culture, civilization is who we are as a species. And what we're finding right now, and what you and I are talking about, is this failure to be trustworthy the way one would hope we would be with our children and our grandchildren, um, th this failure to be trustworthy. And I think it's largely because we haven't built it in at the base of these institutions, what they are required to do and required to be. In our country, we have a constitution and that pretty much lays out what the government is supposed to be. Do you think that's a good place to start? Start with the constitution in terms of establishing the rules and boundaries for the government and use it as a sort of template? I mean, that's what it was designed for, right? Well, yeah, of course, it, of course it was. And, and yes, of course it is. And at the same time, it's a structure that's out there, just as our corporate structure is a structure that's out there. And each of these things are things that we've set up as human beings. Um, pr prior to COVID uh, coming and kind of stopping uh, a lot of travel and a lot of engagement, I went on a world tour and my thesis was that people everywhere really want the same thing. And you and I are talking around that ourselves right now, that we want the same thing. And I wanted to find out what that was. So I went to, I don't know, 15 different countries. I went to five or six of the continents. I was in really poor countries. I was in really wealthy countries. I was in democracies. I was in dictatorships and autocracies. Everywhere, when I talked to the people, I gathered a group together and it could be a group from 30 to, to 500. And I said, you know, this is your conversation. Um, what would you like? What would you like uh, if it were 200 years from now and we'd arrived at a golden civilization? What would it be? What would it be like? So I didn't start with a constitution. I started with us, with our, the best of our nature. What is it we would like for our children, our grandchildren? Everywhere I went, people wanted the same thing. They wanted kindness. They wanted um, uh, an end to corruption. They wanted to be able to trust the news and trust uh, the institutions that, uh, whether it was government or corporations. Um, they wanted, of course, an end to war and an end to uh, uh, poverty. Um, but what was stunning to me was wherever I went, however rich or poor, however diminished their freedoms or expanded their freedoms were, they all wanted the same thing. So I would start with who we are and I would use the Constitution as a very good kind of model of where we, where our founders thought that those lines were back at the beginning of our, of our uh, country. Interesting. We are just about out of time, but while you were saying that, so peace on earth, goodwill towards men seems to be the, the theme of everyone's wish, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, it's a beautiful right. idea. Let's hope we get there. Uh, George, right. we got to wrap this up. Thanks so much for coming on. The book you is bet. called The Three Domains of Freedom. Has it been released? Here it is. There it Here is. Here it is. Yep. Is it out and available now? It is. You can you can uh, certainly get it on Amazon uh, and uh, with uh, pressing a couple of buttons. OK, last question. Do you have a website you want to give out? I do. The um, the uh, the website for me personally and all the things that I've done is georgekinder.com. The website, if you want to find a fiduciary advisor, would be the Kinder Institute dot com. Well, George, thanks. I, we could have gone on. This is a big topic. You know, we can't cover it, a drop of this in 15 service. minutes. But yeah, good I think to talk with you, Douglas. We yeah, did give people you. an overview of the book. So, yeah. all right. Best of luck, George. Thanks a lot. Yeah, bye-bye.